please join me in offering a warm town hall welcome to Francis Moore LePay and Adam Heiken. Thank you. Thank you. Do we need the mic? Oh, or? We don't need it, right? Okay. Is the, are our mics on? They, they are. Can you hear me? Excellent. <laughs> Great. Well, we are thrilled to be here. Absolutely. It's we a were joy. just so excited standing back there, and then we heard a few claps with Democracy, Democracy Spring. Spring, our heart soared. Um, so, um, we are going to just start with uh, introducing ourselves, and then we're each taking part of our message to you tonight. So, um, the biggest lesson from Diet for a Small Planet that I took away was that hunger is not caused by scarcity of food, it's caused by scarcity of democracy. So for all these decades, I have been swimming in one stream, but it's had two currents, food and democracy. But something happened in 2015, I made a public pledge that I would spend the rest of my life focusing on the mother of all issues, democracy itself. Now, what do I do? So I listened to you know, Woody Allen's line, 90% of life is showing up. So I showed up. I got on the plane to Mexico City to the first global conference on getting money out of politics. I thought that would be a good start. What, what I didn't know would happen, standing in the rain at the Mexico City <laughs> airport, waiting for the bus to the hotel, I bump into this guy. And there it is. So he's going to tell you his intro. So who am I is a great question. I'm not going to get into that because I'm a New York Jew. Existential you know, question right there real gets to the core of me. But basically, my political story is a little bit different, but really not that different. Because my political formation came on November 17th, 2011 which if anyone knows, it was the two-month anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. I was a freshman in college. Yes, I, I am that young. <laughs> um, and it was this moment where I felt such political power, such, such joy that I had a voice that I really could shape the world. I could change things, that I wasn't powerless. Um, the only problem was I didn't know exactly how to make that change, because it seemed like my interests were all over the place, that I wanted to prevent hunger, I wanted to uh, stop climate change, I wanted to make sure that, you know, that uh, everyone had a livable, livable wage. But, um, you know, so I concluded to myself that I couldn't do everything. That is until the following year, when I joined a group called Democracy Matters, which is basically a, an organization that trains students to fight for democracy reform, like campaign finance. And I said, huh. Maybe I can actually fight for everything, because ultimately we can't make progress on anything until we fix democracy first. And so I followed that path, I, I focused on democracy, and led me to work with... Mexico City. Mexico City, <laughs> and then the, the rest is history, and we wrote a book together. So Frankie's right, going to talk so, about the fun stuff. So um, we are dividing our talk into two halves, and he gets the good half. He gets the solution end of it. I have to tell you about the crisis. So bear with me, because he's going to get you the good stuff soon. So um, I want to start with sharing the one realization that drives us both, and that is democracy is not a choice. Democracy is the only pathway, the only pathway that aligns with human nature. It's the only way to govern ourselves that we think history has shown has a chance of bringing forth the best in us and keeping the worst in check. Now that we know virtually all of us have both in us, democracy is the pathway. It is the only one. And we uh, also um, want to define democracy, at least what we're talking about since we use the word a lot. So we define it as three conditions. One condition is the wide and inclusive dispersion of power. Second condition, because we know humans don't do that well when things are secret, so the second condition is transparency in public relations. The third condition is more a cultural norm. It is refusing to participate in the blame game and realizing a culture of mutual accountability. Somebody said to me recently, Frankie, a few people are guilty, but we're all responsible. <laughs> and I really like that. That's the theme of the third condition. Now, I'm also quite aware that 
none of these will probably ever be fully realized, maybe, by human beings. But I love the, the observation of the first African-American appellate judge in our country. He said, democracy is not being, it is becoming. It is easily lost, but never finally won. Its essence is eternal struggle. Now, honestly, I used to drop off the last part of that quote about struggle, but with Adam, we have discovered that it is the good struggle. So I want to make sure I always add his last part of that beautiful statement. So really, the most useful way to judge ourselves is the direction we're headed, because democracy is a journey. It is a journey that we do together. And so in this moment, unfortunately, our charge is that we're in retreat. We're in retreat. And now is the time, and we're going to cover both of them tonight, now is the time to ask ourselves, why? How did we get to a broken state? And how do we reverse course to be continuing on our journey toward democracy? So let me just begin by <laughs> reminding us what Adam and I mean by broken broken democracy in three figures. One figure is near zero. Near zero is the number, <laughs> the precise number that was given by academics looking at data deep study about influence of average Americans on political choices in Washington. Their conclusion, our impact, near zero. The second number is one half of one percent. That's the share of Americans who provided, the, provided more than two-thirds of the $6.4 billion that the 2016 election cost. Third, one in six. One in six is the portion of Americans who say that they would now settle for military rule. So we start with a very sober place. Now to reverse course, to heal and to move forward, we have to know how did we get here. And very few Americans grasp that um, this, what we're going to lay out, I think, and, and I'd love your feedback during the discussion, is that here is our understanding. That we have to understand that human beings are unique in our in that we are creatures of the mind and that we don't see the world as it is but through culturally determined filters which aren't so bad if they are life-serving. In fact, that can be good. But um, we are now alive in a time when the dominant narrative, the dominant filter is one that is life-destroying. Just to put some weight behind this observation that it is theory which decides, I like to quote Albert Einstein who said, it is theory which decides what we can observe. So here it is. What ideas are powerful enough to make this smart species creating conditions that virtually none of us would ever choose? In fact, that actually violate some pretty deep survival instincts. So what is this worldview? Well, for us, it starts with a long, history of a very dark view of human nature. It, you could go way back to Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, he uses a, a Latin proverb, we are to each other as wolves, it's translated. But all the way then through Milton Friedman, who said that essentially we can only count on self-interest and therefore we should turn over as much as possible to the market that will fairly sort out incomes because we faulty humans couldn't possibly figure it out. So we absorb the notion that if you peel away the fluff from human nature, all we can count on is that we are self-interested, we're materialistic, and we're competitive. And boy, that works great with a competitive market. It'll solve it all. Now, Ronald Reagan actually named it magic. He called it the magic of the marketplace. And of course with magic, it's a kick. You don't want to look behind the curtain to figure out how it really works. But we say that if you do look behind the curtain, you realize there is no such thing as a market without rules. That's fiction. And 
We call our current market then, yes, it is driven by rule, but by one central rule, and that is highest return to existing wealth. So wealth accrues to wealth accrues to wealth, until here we are now, the United States with the most extreme economic inequality, not only in the Western world, but even more so than dozens of countries that we really wouldn't like to compare ourselves with, say, like India, or countries in Africa, like Liberia more extreme inequality. So, here we are. Um, here we are, and so we came up with a name for it, which we think is very accurate. We call it brutal capitalism. Its consequences are indeed brutal. For what happens then, if you buy this notion that the market fairly sorts out outcomes, then the world is really made up of winners and losers, or makers and takers. I believe it was, uh, yes, it was um, Paul Ryan who said that almost half of our country is made up of takers. And so we end up generating a culture of shame and blame in which those who are down and out are told to blame somebody else, not the system, not uh, rules of the system, but other people. In other words, American whites encouraged to blame, people of color. Um, we're, we're set up against each other in this shame and blame culture. Now, a second consequence of this one rule economy and the culture of blame and shame brutal capitalism is the political peace. And that is, in virtually all cases where wealth is this tightly held, it infuses and infects and distorts the political system. And so we end up with what should be an oxymoron, but I like to call privately held government, is what we end up with. And so all of this, I think a lot of you are aware of the outline of what I've said. But what really rocked us, what really shook us up, is the realization um, that all of this, you know, didn't just somehow evolve, right? Some spontaneous, once we had these ideas, it just uh, sort of flowed along. Something radically shifted in the 1970s. And what we mean by that is that a lot of people thought that the 60s, I was a community organizer in the war on poverty, and you know, for a lot of us, it was a great decade in which civil rights and women's liberation and the environmental movement, there was a great progress for human beings. But for others, it was really scary. It was very, very dangerous. And one of those people, who a very frightened soul, was named Lewis Powell. How many of you have ever heard of the Powell Memo? Well, I'm glad, because not many people have. And we, let me just underscore, we are not conspiracy theorists. We're talking from the public record. And Lewis Powell was a corporate lawyer, later to be very soon after this, what I'm going to describe to you, he was appointed uh, as a Supreme Court Justice. But he was very worried, and his friends in the Chamber of Commerce asked Lewis Powell to write a, sense, a call to action, what can be done to save the American free enterprise system. And so he wrote a 34-page memo that begins with this deep, deep worry. He says, few elements of American society today have as little influence as the American businessman. And indeed, we must marshal all our resources against those who would destroy it, destroy the free enterprise system. Um, so he laid out uh, not a mere exhortation, but a real game plan. And what struck us as we wrote Daring Democracy is how eerily all the pieces that he talks about in this memo have actually been carried out, been carried out with enormous funding from a, a relative handful of billionaires. And again, we're not conspiracy theorists. We're describing what we're learning from the public record. Many of you have heard of them, the fossil-fueled Koch brothers um, and their like-minded billionaire families, including the Olins, uh, fortune from chemicals, including DDT, uh, the shafes of banking money, the mercers of computer breakthroughs and communication, and the DeVos family of Amway and many, many others, but really not that many, but 
people of tremendous wealth. And so we then describe in two tight chapters what we call um, the effective, the eight strategies of highly effective billionaires. And so we got it, boiled it down into two categories, manipulating the mindset and rigging the rules, right? So on the manipulating the mindset, um, certainly there were any number of think tanks putting out papers and getting things quoted in the media uh, and being taken up by government. One striking number was that the Heritage Foundation produced almost 1,300 specific policies that it wanted the Reagan administration to adopt. Can you imagine that book? And the Reaganites adopted 61% of these policies. Very successful. And um, also, in terms of getting their views out through the media, um, someone did a thorough kind of 10-year tally of how often the media picked up picked up uh, uh, information from various think tanks from different points of view, and they found that from these um, think tanks that were po promoting this narrow market as solution, government as the enemy worldview, that their, their quotes were found about 51% of all the quotes from think tanks, whereas for progressives, it was about 14%. Very successful. But the anti-democracy movement, as we call it, didn't just you know, infuse its worldview through the media. It also remade the media. Uh, I'll just mention a couple of ways in which it remade them. Because when I was growing up, it was understood that the media, the public airways, were a public good. And it actually, it was in, in the documents of the agencies involved that the, the, the listener and the viewer was the primary, had, the listeners and the viewers' interests were paramount, not the broadcasters' views. But what happened? What happened was that in um, in the um, in the in 1987, a very important year for our society, the fairness doctrine was eliminated. That meant that no longer were the public airways. Uh, required to really offer a range of views. And then in 1996, another big change happened when in the Telecommunications Act that the beginning a very radical uh, removal of standards that prevented monopoly in the media. So it wasn't just infusing messages, it was also changing the media radically. But perhaps the most important part of the success of this worldview, this anti-government, pro-market worldview. Now, if that's your end, is to convince people that the government doesn't work for them, and therefore you should shrink it, shrink it, shrink its role, and so the market can be more in the service of business, then what do you do? It, it, it seems so obvious now that you do everything possible to make government nasty, <laughs> conflicted, uh, uh, unproductive, basically dysfunctional. And then of course people will look, you know, will withdraw any hope that the government can serve them. And Newt Gingrich, who um, uh, who's later became the Speaker of the House, as you probably know, he likened the pushing of this agenda of this extreme right view to war that has to be fought on a scale and a duration and a savagery of civil war. The GOP distributed a treatise in which it laid out for its GOP legislators that their goal is not to, quote, prevail in an argument, but, quote, destroy the enemy's fighting power, war. And if that's not enough to make <laughs> uh, us, you know, withdraw and to think, oh, I don't want any part of that, it's, is that, um, they literally made government dysfunctional by filibuster, locking things up, and even forcing government shutdown in 2013, costing all of us taxpayers $24 billion. And so we shouldn't be surprised uh, that by 2016, the confidence in Congress had crashed to 9% of us. Now, the second part of, the, of this 
agenda was the rigging of the rules. I've talked about the manipulation of the mindset. The second part is the rigging of the rules, starting with the Supreme Court. I think few Americans realize that the case that was ultimately brought to the Supreme Court that became the Citizens United ruling, that was brought by the DeVos family, investing in a, a law firm that just kept pushing and pushing and pushing until it made it to the Supreme Court. Uh, so that was one avenue, right? Because the, that would make it po impossible to put the kind of uh, protections against big money. And of course, 80% of Americans disagree with that ruling. The rigging of the rules also, of course, involves passing laws, uh, including state attacks on voting rights and, for example, imposing a voter ID to reduce, and to reduce polling places, but to reduce voting by exactly the people that they knew would be most hurt by these policies, of course. People of color, low-income people. And while there are many estimates on how many, say, African Americans, when this big effort got underway to, uh, to bring forth voter ID, and that sort of thing, that one estimate was that 25% of African Americans, this is a 2006 study, 25% did not have these IDs that would be required. So that was an obvious scheme then to, to require them. So since 2000, 32 states have enacted voter ID laws. And just to take one, one state, uh, Wisconsin, that Trump won Wisconsin by about 23,000 votes, while two academics estimated that roughly that is twice the number uh, of, that had been blocked from voting by voter ID requirements. And then many of you know now, and in fact this is coming to the Supreme Court, about gerrymandering. In other words, rigging districts so that basically one party is sure to win. And um, that also, uh, the GOP put $30 million in 2010 into concerted effort for that rejiggering. Uh, and in 11 states then, Republicans took both houses and state legislators, even though in some cases hardly won the majority of votes. But the strategy has not been just amping up uh, or making these legislative changes or adding up more and more lobbyists for this cause, although that has happened. Now, um, but it's um, also the nature of lobbying has changed, and this is another big wake up for us, that lobbyists, you know, the name comes from people in the lobby, you know, that they grab the legislator, maybe not literally, but, uh, you know, and push their ideas. But what has changed with this anti-democracy movement, we call it, is that lobbyists have actually become co-creators of legislation, sitting down in the conference rooms, in the drafting rooms, working through the legislation. And under the guy, under the banner, under the leadership of the American Legislative Exchange Council, many of you know that acronym, ALEC, and it's been a huge success, passing democracy-killing me measures that have curtailed voting rights and wiped out local democracy in a number of cases. What we didn't know is just how successful that this effort has added up annually to the equivalent of ALEC helping to pass two to three laws every year for every state in the nation. So in the big picture, though, um, we want to underscore that there are two particular keys to the power of these attacks on democracy. One um, is just what Lewis Powell recommended. It's been highly concentrated. The Koch brothers uh, have biannual uh, conferences where they make sure that we're all on the same page and coordinating their funding. But what really shocked us is the change in the landscape as a result of this uh, strategies of these billionaire families. And that is that the action has moved outside of political parties. At least political parties are visible and at least somewhat accountable. They publish their, their, um, their platforms. But listen to this, that the anti-democracy movement, according to an academic study, found that by 2013 and 14, 70% of the total resources on the right 
were non-party organizations. A lot of that in the Koch Brother Network. The Koch Brother Network uh, employs three and a half times the number of people in the uh, GOP National Committee and Congressional and in campaign arms. So they're all in, have been invisibly then pulling the Republican Party to the right. And the consequences are intense. Of course, distrust, inequality deepens, distrust deepens, and brutal capitalism, this cycle of shame and blame, we see increasingly. Uh, often using racism, of course, as to bolster the blame, intensifying a gap between the minority of the wealthy and the rest of us. For example, while workers' wages have been pretty flat since Lewis Powell wrote that memo, CEO pay has increased 16-fold. And so, most shocking to us, especially as we were in that Mexico City gathering of hundreds of countries represented, the U.S. now ranks 52nd in the world in electoral integrity. So, that's the bad news. Now, let me say that in our very first chapter, this is how we frame our lives and our book. We say that it is not the magnitude of a challenge that crushes the human spirit. It is not. It is only feeling useless that does us in, feeling futile that does us in. And if three conditions are met throughout human history, we have proven that we can sometimes do that which was believed to be impossible. Now, what are those conditions? We have to believe that what we are up against, we have to solve. It is essential that we solve it. You know, if your child's going to die, you will do anything to get that medicine to save your child. It has to feel that essential. And I think more and more Americans are getting it. Democracy is essential. Two, we have to believe that the challenge before us is at least possible. And Adam is going to convince you, yes, it is. And there are many more we can say uh, through examples of what's happening today. He's going to help convince us that it is possible big task. But I also want to say, just right here for before we get into the nitty gritty, that when we say democracy is possible, what we mean also to do is to challenge that reductive view of human nature as selfish, materialistic, competitive. Because actually, if you look at our evolution and you look at, at studies done on, on us in the, in the lab, you see that, of course, you know, we evolved in tightly knit tribes and became the most social of all species. And that we have deep capacity for empathy and cooperation. We, we helped each other raise our children in, in tribal life and became intensely able to read each other and cooperate. And on fairness, yes, it's not just the human species, that many primates have a deep sense of fairness. I love uh, to focus on cooperation because they looked at our brains when, with MRI scans when we're both competing and cooperating, and they find that when we cooperate, it's so pleasurable that our brains light up like eating chocolate. So when I say democracy is possible, I'm saying we don't have to change human nature to be able to bring forth these essential ingredients of a democratic culture. And finally, the third condition and this is where Adam's really going to weigh in. Third condition, first, something has to be essential, possible, and the third, there has to be a place for us. We have to see how we can be useful to order to believe that we can move forward. So, Adam, take it away. Okay, I will. <laughs> well... That was depressing, I suppose. Um, so I get the challenging task of convincing you that, uh, with the uh, of convincing you of a relatively difficult thing, that despite what Frankie just said, I, we, are more hopeful than we ever have been before. So despite of this concerted, deliberate anti-democracy movement we have more hope than ever before. And that's also taking into account our current president. So, 
So, I think the best way to give this to you is a, let's say, a, a verbal play. It's gonna be entitled, Hope in Three Acts. So I'm gonna take you through three acts that kind of led our own process for why we have hope. So act one. One of the things that you probably, perhaps know, is that people are upset. People know that something isn't working. It's pretty intuitive at this point. Whether they voted for Bernie Sanders, which I'm sure many of you here in the audience did, or even Hillary Clinton, who had one of the strongest democracy reform platforms really ever, which I'll talk about perhaps later. Or Donald Trump. Drain the swamp, right? That was a direct targeted message to voters who felt powerless. So the assumption here is probably people know that things are bad. I, I'm seeing some nods, you, you kind of know it. But what I want to say is that ultimately, the data shows this too. 85% of Americans want fundamental changes in the way we fund our elections. 85%. Find me any other issue, maybe with the exception of universal background checks, that has that high level of support. Really. And the, the interesting thing is this really does cut across uh, partisan divide. It's Republicans, Democrats, moderates. People believe there's just too much money in politics. And it's intuitive. That's obvious, you say. Okay, fine, fine, fine. 60% of Americans believe that we should do everything we can to ensure that every American has the right to vote. 60%. Less than 85, granted. But that's still enough to pass a bill in the Senate. So, you know, breaks filibuster. So I'm willing to say that's a, that's a win. And the last one, which I think is most important, is three quarters of Americans believe that they themselves have too little influence in Washington, D.C. 75% of Americans feel powerless, and they express it. People are angry. That's a great place to start. But that's not the only reason we're not starting from scratch when it comes to combating this horrendous anti-democracy movement that has wrought so much havoc, and which I would say, and we argue in the book, is the, the reason, the direct reason why we currently have President Trump. Trump did not happen out of nowhere. It was a result of this coordinated effort to delegitimize democracy and to unleash money in politics and to suppress the vote. But this is, I wanna kind of hammer on the second point of not starting from scratch. People have put a lot of effort into designing policies. You know, as, as much as there are right-wing think tanks, so too are there actually democracy think tanks that do really great work. People have put the intellectual effort in to design policy. And so we're not starting from scratch, the intellectual scratch either. We know kind of give or take what we should do in terms of policy. And there's also this other kind of radical thing, so bear with me, I know this is difficult, but there are um, other countries out there and this is, this is the shocking part, actually. Um, they also have democracy in a lot of these places. I know, I know it's difficult, I know. So, <laughs> so um, I actually spent a year in, in France studying how other countries do this work, how they deal with money in politics, how they you know, deal with drawing district lines. So we're not starting from scratch either, because here's a spoiler. Other countries do a much better job on this stuff than we do. Just a you know, small spoiler here. So we're not starting from scratch. One, everyone is fed up. Everyone. Trump voter, Sanders voter, Clinton voter, doesn't, doesn't matter. People are angry. Two, we're not starting from scratch intellectually. That's a great place to start. I can't really see your faces, but I hope you're nodding. <laughs> so that's act one. We're not starting from scratch. We have broad-based support, and we have the intellectual support to get this done. Act two. Despite the anti-democracy movement's success in rolling back our democracy, citizens have been stepping up for decades. Really, actually, since Powell wrote his memo, citizens have been stepping up at a slower pace, less funded, and you know, many other things, granted. But people step up, and we have seen victories. Again, slowly, but we had victories. I think to the first states that enacted public financing of elections, 
at least in a partial way, Minnesota and Maryland in the 1970s. And since then, many other like municipalities and partial states have followed suit. And New York City became the first state with public financing. So for those of you who don't know, public financing, although you really should know, because as I'll talk about this, Seattle is a great example of a publicly financed municipality. It's basically deferring part of the, the funding to government. So instead of relying on all private financing, the government matches it or gives a voucher, I'll again speak to this later, or some sort of public grant. And so it decreases the need to fundraise. New York City became the first, well, really the, the main case that we oftentimes will, will quote, where for every small do dollar donation, it's matched at a six to one rate. So your $10 turns into $70. And it's, it's, the program has worked really well. Maine became the first state, and we chronicle the story of Maine in our book in 1996. And, and one quick thing about Maine, which is really great, is that people were so pessimistic that they could pass this law that the campaign manager, uh, who is now the leader of one of the big organizations in Washington, D.C., that deals with money and politics, he recounted a story that a pollster in Maine refused to conduct a poll for him about three-plus months away from the election because the pollster said it would be morally bankrupt of him to do it because you have no chance. He refused the money, said, I can't do this, but they won. They still won in spite of that because they had people power. So, and, and the victories, the thing about the victories that is really important is that, you know, it extends not just to money and politics. I focus right there on money and politics, but voting too. I mean, we have early voting in a lot of states, same day registration. Uh, a lot of states are now following suit with uh, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds. There are studies that show that if you, even if you can't register, you know, the voting age is 18, if you allow younger folks to register, they're much more likely to maintain their registration and actually vote. And states are making progress on this, you know, in the past decades. But there's something more than just that. It's that in recent years, and I, I may be young, but my work in this has ex kind of, I've seen this change just in my short time doing this work, is that there's increasing momentum for the different places that are enacting these reforms. Instead of years between major reforms, we're seeing quickening pace. And I, and I really mean quickening. Just in the time I was in France for a year, there were numerous victories at increasing paces, including Seattle. And I'll, I want to talk about Seattle because I think it's so important. And Seattle was really one of the things that made me so excited because in 2015, the About Initiative, you guys passed really the first functional voucher system for funding cam uh, campaigns in the country. And you did it via ballot initiative, and I think that's incredibly important, as I'll explain in a second. But that's the, that, on that, you passed it on election day 2015, and two other places passed democracy reform as well. Maine, which bolstered its public financing of elections, and Ohio passed uh, a redistricting reform. And so there's kind of this, this sense in the community that, well, huh, these things are passing via ballot initiative. People are upset and they're willing to act. And so that's exciting. And so what you found is on election day, it was kind of the culmination of this real momentum. While most of us were probably either crying or drinking our sorrows away on election night 2016, most people probably didn't realize that 14 out of 17 ballot initiatives about democracy, pro-democracy ballot initiatives, passed. 14 out of 17 passed. Now, I have to give you a little bit of trouble here because one of them that didn't pass, that should have passed, was public financing for Washington State. So, that one's on you, but I digress. So, there is momentum and we're getting reform. And so, why is that important? Why is this an important event? Why does this give me hope? These are states, right? This, is, this doesn't solve the national crisis. True, true. But there are three points I want to make. One, it's exactly what I said, momentum. We're seeing increasing momentum for reform. That, that's a sign of something, which I'll go into. Two, when it's on the ballot, almost always Washington State, we win. And one of the ballot initiatives that, I, that shocked me the most, that I didn't think would pass, was in South Dakota. 
There was a similar anti-corruption measure that you guys had, but it passed in South Dakota. South Dakota has voted for Republicans in 80% of all statewide elections since it's, since it's become a state. 80% of all statewide elections were won by the GOP. And yet they passed one of the most sweeping pieces of anti-corruption legislation that dealt with money and politics that had a voucher program. And it passed in deep red South Dakota. Right? No one tell me that this is, not, this is just a liberal issue. False. Right? Now, the legislature in, in, in South Dakota ended up repealing it, but people are really, really angry about it, and they're mobilizing to get it back on. So, that's remarkable. So, momentum, when it's on the ballot, it wins. But three, and this is really important, each state that passes reform gives us more information about the reform. So, Oregon becomes the very first state to implement automatic voter registration in 2015. It goes into effect January 1st, 2016. And AVR is really simple. All it does is streamline the voter registration process. How many people have been to the DMV and filled out a form, the same form, with your information, like 16 times, right? It's a name, address, last four, social security number, and a couple of other things, right? All AVR does, essentially, is just streamlines that. Fill out one form, and if you want to opt out, you opt out and then they just send the information to the Board of Elections anyway. It streamlines it. And what happened in Oregon is in the first three months of the program, registrations tripled. The, rate, the, the, the number of re people registering to the program tripled than it had in the previous cycle. So we're seeing, we saw massive increase of voter registrations in Oregon because of this simple reform. And in the next cycle, we'll get more information, and that'll bolster our claim. But that's not the most exciting part, because ultimately, with the data, we create even more momentum because it shows it works. So Oregon becomes the first state. Nine states and Washington, D.C. have followed suit. <laughs> totally making our registration system more efficient, more cost effective, less error prone, and increasing the power um, of voters because you're increasing the number of voters. I mean, that is incredible progress. In two years, essentially, 10 states and D.C., and Nevada has it on the ballot in 2018. Massachusetts is working on it right now. And Washington State could also be another one. So we're looking at potentially 15 states in five years. That's incredible progress. And we get more and more information. But again, one of the things that I want to highlight is I was just talking to the, today, well, let me backtrack. Today, the Go Governor Brown of California signed something called the Disclose Act. And it's one of the most radical pieces of disclosure legislation of dark money and political, you know, of, of campaign finance in the country. And I was talking, you know, I, I sent a couple of messages back and forth with the, the, one of the people leading this effort. And he said to me, he said, you know, we've been working on this for seven years now. I can't really believe it passed. But one of the things that I've always held so true to me or held so close is that people kept getting so excited that if we pass this, we can be a model for the nation. We can inspire other states. So just like with Oregon that ins inspired other states to follow suit, once they took the leap, other states followed. And California took a, took a leap, and hopefully other states follow. So there's some real hope here. Momentum, we're getting more data, and when it's on the ballot, it passes. I mean, these are really important things. And then add that on to the fact that we're not starting from scratch, and um, and the fact that uh, public opinion is on our side, now all of a sudden we're, we're kind of fomenting something larger. Something's happening, which gets us into Act 3, which if there's one thing to take from my talk, it's this. So I want you to close your eyes for a second. I want you to imagine yourself in front of the Capitol building. You've been there before, I'm sure, but something is a little different. You were probably there for, I don't know, a high school trip or maybe an eighth grade trip, or you've been there in recent years. But something is different. It might be the fact that there's about a thousand people around you right now. There's seeming chaos, there are police, and um, people are chanting. What are they chanting? They're chanting, one person, one vote. One person, one vote. Get money out of politics. And then you look over and you see at the Capitol steps, there are 400 people sitting down in front of the Capitol. 
the police start taking them away. They still chant, one person, one vote. They look happier than they ever could be in, in the world. This is the moment that really defined this book. What I was just describing took place on April 11th, 2016. And it was, it was called Democracy Spring. And, and Frankie and I were there. And that's where we really became friends. And what was happening is it was a national movement. It was a mobilization that had one simple idea. Let's spark this issue. Let's, let's force this issue onto the agenda. And they decided, oh, this is what we'll do. We'll create a march from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C., 140 miles. And then we're going to engage in seven straight days of civil disobedience on the Capitol steps. So they will not be able to ignore us. And we're going to do it in the name of getting big money out of politics and making sure that every American has the right to vote. And we did it. We did it. That's where Frankie and I became friends on the march. Frankie, to her credit, was really one of the only public pledgers, the kind of the celebrities who endorsed the movement, who actually marched the whole thing, with the exception of, yeah, 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 actually, yeah. It was pretty remarkable, actually. And the one day that she missed, she flew to Wisconsin to give a speech about Democracy Spring. So talk about commitment. I mean, you know, incredible. So, but we became friends because on a march, I don't know if you've ever been on like a hike, but there's not really much to do but talk. So imagine that for nine full days from, you know, 8 and 30 in the morning until 6 at night. All we did was talk. We talked with everybody, but really Frankie and I hit it off almost immediately because we knew each other and, you know, as we'll, as we'll describe, we, we, we share a lot of the core concepts. But the important part about Democracy Spring is that what it was, it wasn't just a single organization. It was endorsed by over 120 organizations. And another, uh, that it spanned from racial justice groups to labor groups to environmental groups. All issues seemingly represented decided to endorse what we were doing, that we needed to address democracy. And we were met on the very last day of, of the direct action aspect by another, another kind of mobilization called Democracy Awakening. And the difference isn't that important. But with Democracy Awakening, it was actually endorsed by over 200 organizations, including the NAACP, uh, Communication Workers of America, Sierra Club, and the list goes on. And we converged. So there were over 200 organizations in total, probably over 250, deciding that we're going to lend our name to this massive effort for democracy reform. And Frankie and I, when we really thought about it, said, whoa, whoa, something is really happening here. People are really going across issues to fight for democracy, right? Little did we know, right? That might have been the kind of the moment we realized it, but it wasn't the first time that people in the movement had realized it. We kind of came to the party a little bit late. In 2013, give or take, a bunch of in, kind of the most prominent leaders in the reform movements, so Sierra Club, Communication Workers of America, Common Cause, good government groups, environment groups, labor groups, came together and said, you know, we're not making progress on any of the issues that we're working on because we keep coming up against the wall of big money and voter suppression. So here's a novel idea. Let's create our own organization that represents all of us, throw resources at it, and then also commit to our own work that we devote a certain portion of our resources, of our effort, of our energy, of our staff to fighting for democracy as well. It's a twofer. We'll create an organization and we'll use our own organizations to fight for democracy itself. And it's called Democracy Initiative. And now there's over 60 groups that are part of this commitment to democracy that represent, are you ready for this? 30 million members. 30 million for democracy. And this is but one example of two shifts in the consciousness about the fight for democracy that we highlight in the book. And we call it the movement of movements approach. And we say that this embodies everything I'm talking about, which is the fact that there is a democracy movement. If there's one thing to take away from this book, it is that there is a democracy movement and it is happening now. But these shifts are simple. One, people are fighting for their own issues, but they're not giving up their issues 
in favor of, or, or to fight for democracy. They're bridging them. They realize that you can fight for environmental justice, you can fight for democracy. And a friend of ours, Josh Silver, who founded Represent Us, which is an organization that deals with money and politics, says, or said to us, you know you can love two children at once. Right? I can't speak to that. I'm 24. I don't have kids. She does, and she says it's a uh, you know, worthwhile expression, so I, I trust her. Um, and so people are increasingly realizing that you can love two children at once. You can love the food movement. You know, Frankie embodies this. You can love the food movement. You can love, well, you're not, you don't love world hunger, but you can love fighting to alleviate world hunger, but also focus on democracy. And that goes for all issues. And the second shift that is equally as important is the fact that people within the democracy world, oftentimes people who are fighting for money in politics have stayed in money in politics, and there are other folks fighting for voting rights. But because the movement, the anti-democracy movement that Frankie was talking about, was so concerted and so broad with all of the things that it was attacking at once, people are now realizing that so too must we be equally broad with our resistance. We have, we, what good is getting money out of politics if you can't vote? It's not, and vice versa. And so people are increasingly realizing that we must be broad-based with our approach. And so groups are realizing this, that you now show up, even if you're a money and politics group, people show up when there's an assault on voting. They're showing up to, uh, to bring attention to the fact that right now that the Presidential uh, Commission on, on Election Integrity is potentially gearing up to suppress votes, right? People are showing up in a way that's never been done before. And so we go into the book, and I won't, you know, I'll, I'll be short with time now, or I'll kind of cut it, but we go into the book about this isn't just something that we claim. It really is happening, and it's exciting. It really is exciting. And I want to talk about why it's exciting, because I think this, is, this is, gets to the heart of, again, why we chose to write this book. And so Frankie and I will talk about it together. Um, because this is, I think, ultimately the number one reason for why we became friends. Because when we realized that we shared this vision about what it means to fight for democracy, then we realized we agreed on everything. And just for the record, we didn't disagree on a single word of this book. <laughs> 60,000 words, we didn't disagree once. So it shows just how much this commitment can really serve as a bond. So. We realized that when we did that march for Democracy Spring, when we were you know, engaging with all the actions for Democracy Spring, when it was over, we realized something was different about us. We weren't the same people. And I have a feeling that anyone here who has been involved with activism can relate to this. We tried to give name to this, these shifts, these emotional shifts that we felt in ourselves. And the first one we called civil courage. It's a pretty simple idea. I didn't think I could walk 10 miles, <laughs> and I walked over 100. But the, the civil courage part of it is this that, that really changed us, is realizing that doing what we thought we could not do with others and knowing that that, that uh, experience of sharing the, sharing the experience is what may be, made me able to do what I could not do. So it, it's showing up for that which you don't know if you can do, and that means you've got to be able to rethink fear itself. And I know in my own life, you know, I've got really used to the uh, judgment, you know, with a pounding heart when I was really nervous that I was out of step and my heart would pound, and I used to really put myself down, oh, you're so weak. And then I realized, no, we must reframe the pounding heart. It is our inner applause <laughs> telling us yeah. we are doing exactly what we should be doing for ourselves and our planet. So that's number one, civil courage. So number two, it's meeting people who you would never have met otherwise. And so it's that come being out of isolation and loneliness. You know, loneliness is a plague in this culture. And when we get involved with people for democracy, what happened, uh, like on this march, uh, there I was on the church floor uh, getting ready, getting my sleeping bag out, and I'm talking to an Iraq vet. I'm talking to an ex-banker. I'm talking to a teenager from California. All of these folks, I said, wait, I would never have met any of them if it hadn't been for the democracy movement. So this shift 
is feeling that, oh yeah, I'm not such an oddball. You know, there are people from totally different walks of life who share this commitment. And that was so strengthening. So that's number two. Yeah, and, and just adding on to that, you learn from other people. You learn from their experiences and you become more more of a complete person by getting to know people who you just wouldn't know, especially in a society where we can increasingly isolate ourselves within like-minded communities, right? This is really a moment where you come together across divides. And the last one is that we were taking ownership of our democracy. And we both were there marching on that last day as we entered DC and we were walking down the streets and people were honking and waving from their stoops and we were chanting, whose democracy? Our democracy. Whose democracy? Our democracy. And the dome of the Capitol came into focus and I could almost literally feel the synapses in my brain kind of geez. And something had shifted. I said, oh yeah, right, right, I'm the owner. <laughs> I'm not the victim, I'm not the pleader. This is my, you work for me in those buildings. And that sense of, you know, we often feel the duty, the citizenship, wait a minute, that's our power. That's not some heavy burden, it is thrilling. And so that shift, I don't think I'll ever go back. Yeah. Uh, it's it's ours. This democracy is ours. We own it. So that's the. <laughs> so, in closing, in closing, we close our book by saying, in such a moment in which we are now alive together, the opposite of evil is no longer goodness. The opposite of evil is courage. Because goodness without courageous action is just not good enough. And when we say that, though, we want to really underscore that what we are asking or what we are seeing emerging is nothing that is not us, that we cannot do. It's, it's in us because it meets these deep unmet human needs, our need for meaning in our lives beyond just our own survival, our need for connection with others, and our need for a voice which adds up to what? It adds up to human dignity itself. So this courage we talk about is not superhuman. It is the essence of our humanity. Thank you. same page with you on everything you said tonight and all your intentions tonight. I'm very glad you brought up the question of young people. Impatience <laughs> takes energy. And young people are energetic. And how many people here tonight are under the age of 18? Well, I'm glad to see that. I'm glad to see that. We have to mobilize young people. How do you think we mobilize young people in an effective way in this country. Young people like to get together in big groups. And so how do, how do you particularly motivate people in high school and even in grade school? How would you go about that? Just, you just how would you go about that? How can we all go about that? So Frankie, I'm assuming you'll let me take this one. Yes. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're, you're just, your question gets to the heart of kind of a, a really core part of me. Um, which is, how do you get young people to engage in this stuff? Uh, myself included. I mean, I am, but I'm only 24, so you know, I, I associate with folks who are young. Um, so it's really difficult. The first thing I'll say, and I'll say this quickly, is the first thing we do is we don't blame young people for not being involved. And I'll tell you why, and this is really important. We have only ever known an absolute mess of a political system. Two endless wars, climate change, crippling student debt, and a financial collapse that d eliminated you know, so many people's livelihood. So first off, don't blame us. And it's not saying that we're not culpable for not being involved, but understand where people are coming from. And as to how you get people involved, there's a really simple answer. And it's you teach them how to organize. You have to teach young people how to organize. There are no other ways to learn how to organize other than being taught 
how to organize. You can't just spontaneously become an organizer. It's really tough work. And so this really gets to the core of who I am because one of the things I said in my introduction is I was part of a group called Democracy Matters, which I'm on, still on the board of, and I actually do some pro bono work for them in terms of actually organizing students. So that I really you know, appreciate this question. You have to teach them. And, and one of the things that we do with Democracy Matters is we guide them in the process of organizing. We talk to them once a week. We guide them through how do you put on an event? How do you get new members? And I, I think that's the only way, is that we have to be able to fund and support organizations that teach young people how to organize, while also being empathetic to just how nihilistic it's so easy to be when all we've ever known is such catastrophe. And Adam. The story oh, about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> so so the, I'll, I'll, say, I'll tell this really quickly because I know we're short on time. Uh, at the last Democracy Matters Summit, so we have campuses across the country, um, and we bring them all together in Albany uh, once a year. And usually we'll always ask them, you know, how many, you know, how many of you want to uh, run for office? And normally only a select few, one or two or three or four, raise their hand. At this last conference, which was about a month after Donald Trump had been inaugurated, half of them rose their hand. So, so don't be... And some of them had already filed their papers. Some of them had already filed their papers, too, in their local off, for their local office. So there is hope, but we, we have to give them kind of the support, both financially and uh, intellectually and also just empathetically, to guide them through that process. This question is for you, Francis. I... Uh, like you, I have been an activist since the 70s in various ways. And um, we've lived through a lot of hard times. And we've seen a lot of the efforts that we've made come not only to nothing, but to come to a worse situation than we were in when we started. So how do you, in yourself and in your work, keep up your own hope and your own energy and your own belief that we can really make a difference? Because I struggle with this mm -hmm. every day right Right, now. I struggle with it every day. And I'll tell you two things. One is my office is filled with young people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you can't, they're, you know, they're inheriting everything. So you can't remain depressed, I feel, because young people in our office, they are motivated and they want to contribute so much. Um, so the other thing that, that I tend to do, well, I'm not an optimist. I call myself a possibilist. And we don't have to know that something, we have to be optimistic, oh yeah, it's going to work out. We just have to believe that it's possible that it could. And so I keep this mental list always of what I would never have predicted in my life that has actually happened. And I, I don't really have time to share some of those things, but I just add, I keep a real list. And you know, I was just looking at this um, ranking of ele electoral integrity rankings by this group in, that's based Harvard and Sydney University. And I noticed that in Europe, that among the top are eight countries much higher rated than the US is. And these were countries that were under the communist thumb. And now, you know, I can remember the Cold War and all of that. And yet, they now have electoral systems and democracy systems that rank higher than ours. I mean, maybe that's not, that's not a source of hope for all of us, but for me, I mean, there, there's so many things. I mean, LBJ, we mentioned in our book, I mean, LBJ voted against every civil rights legislation. You know, he didn't vote for any for 20 years. And then he became the um, person who facilitated, you know, the civil, I mean, signed the Civil Rights Act. So I, I, I just think all we have to do is that it's not possible to know what's possible. And that's all we need to know. And then we're free to go for our highest wish. That's all that we can expect from ourselves and others, and that's what keeps me going. And also, just very quickly, you know, you have to also recognize that everything you do now and have done is just laying the groundwork for my generation. And you have to remember that, that oftentimes people who are older than I am will say, I'm sorry for the mess that we left you. But at the same time, had you not been fighting, what kind of mess would we really be in? And all the, the things that you've done and all the, you know, kind of, you know, I was just talking to the, a former head of an organization, and I said, thank you, because you laid the foundation of this intellectual and, and both institutional work 
that I can jump into. So, you know, everything you do now is just letting um, young people step into it. And I think we could also say on that possible, not possible, is if somebody had, before that Mexico City media, if somebody had told me that we would now be standing on the stage telling you about a democracy movement that is a movement of movements, and we just sent around a little mini flyer about a field guide to democracy, a uh, field guide to the democracy movement that's going to be an online site that everybody can come. If somebody had said, yeah, Frankie, that's what you're going to be doing, I wouldn't have thought that was possible in such a short period of time just a couple years that's emerging, so thank you for the question. Hi, um, I'm a retired public school teacher here mm -hmm. in Seattle. Um, very concerned about the state of, of public, public education in the, in the United States, especially with Betsy DeVos at the, at the helm now. Um, and uh, one of the things we worked on a while back was fighting against one of the ballot initiatives that came up in Washington which we felt was an anti-democratic one because basically it was promoting charter schools here in, in Washington, which we had successfully kept out of the state until that, that point. But the money that flowed in yeah. to yeah. support you know, the, uh, the media campaign to get that passed was coming from outside Washington even. So I don't know, I, how, do you, how do you deal with the fact that sometimes the ballot initiatives are put up by folks that you don't agree with. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, can I, can I take this? Sure, sure. Uh, absolutely. And it makes public financing ever more important. But the ballot initiative question is really difficult because it really was actually a Supreme Court case in 1978 that allowed corporations to send money on ballot initiatives. And really, ballot initiatives have been a uh, wonderland for, for corporate and, and billionaire interests. And it's really difficult because you're playing the public relations game. But that's why it's so important that we have to fix the narrative part, the manipulating the mindset part of this you know, anti-democracy movement, that it, we have to win the public relations game when it comes to democracy issues, that we have to treat public education as part of democracy. We can't have democracy without public education. And, and I, I feel really sheepish, if you'll let me just say one thing, Frankie, that I didn't say in the speech, and I said I would, um, and I think this is so important. The Seattle Voucher Program, we're getting the numbers in for this program in the very first cycle, and they're outstanding. This program is so good. The, numbers, the number of people who have given money via vouchers just for these select races, not even all the races, it doesn't include the mayor this cycle. The number of people giving is greater than the number of people who gave to all races in 2013. So there's more small money now, and we still have two months left in the election. So there's still vouchers out there that if anyone hasn't used their voucher, use it. So there's more small money, and this is the best part. The demographics of people who are giving in Seattle are actually representing Seattle. <laughs> what a revolutionary concept that across all demographics, whether it's race, gender, age, socioeconomic status, people are using the vouchers, and candidates are being able to be a sustainable candidate. They're able to be competitive using the voucher. So on those three things, this voucher system is great. And again, Seattle can serve. I know this is kind of, kind of tangential to the topic of public, public education, but Seattle's now serving as a case study and as inspiration for the rest of the country. So I, I just wanted to, I had to get that in there because I'm talking in Seattle, so. <laughs> uh, hi, I was just wondering, um, how you're going to spread your message to a wider audience because mm. I feel like people here, like most people probably already agree with you, um, yeah. especially in a liberal city like Seattle. So I was just wondering how, are you, how you're going to spread your message to more people. You want to go first, Frankie? Um, well, <laughs> um, we definitely, our primary focus is young people and uh, not only now, today we decided we're going to go beyond uh, uh, reaching, trying to reach college students, but also high school students with this message. And we also believe very much in the power of film. So we've, we're supporting the film being made about some of these initiatives so that people can see the, meet the actual people on the ground uh, through a new film about solutions coming up from the state, because I think visuals really help. Uh, but we are really open to all ideas. And so we're gonna be hanging around and 
and signing books and stuff, we'd love to talk to you about the how. Uh, right now, <laughs> quite frankly, <laughs> just getting this book done uh, and getting, you know, beginning, this is just the beginning of our book tour, but we, we talk about it all the time, you know, what, what comes next and how do we reach a broader audience. So we'd love any of your ideas. And uh, thank you for the question, because it is our question also. And um, I, I'm going to jump in too. Because yes, one thing, again, I didn't have time to talk about that I really wanted to, and I explicitly said to Frankie that I would, is that look around the audience and how many of you are white. Um, the democracy movement has long just been white people, been white men. And one of the things that we try and talk about in the book is trying to really working on how to expand the message. But here, here's the key thing that I want to say. Racial justice is a democracy issue, but if you can't go out on the street and not be sure you're not going to be killed, Focusing on public financing cannot be your primary concern. And so it's really important and that we reconceptualize what it means to, to be in solidarity with people of color. It's not good enough to ask people to show up for you. People need to start showing up to end this assault on people of color's bodies, period. No, and, and, and that's, you know, in some respects, it's, it's not a, you know, do it. You got to do it. You got to do more than just say Black Lives Matter. You got to show up and you got to really reconceptualize what it means to stand in solidarity because it's not enough to just say you stand in solidarity. And that's, I think, why this audience is so white. And we're in Seattle, but, you know. Um, Adam, and, 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 I love everything you said. The democracy initiative that we're so excited about, and we sent around a little mini flyer with the Field Guide to Democracy Movement, and that um, that online uh, platform is going to be, we're partnering our little small planet institute with this giant organization. That organization gets it. What yeah, Adam just absolutely. said, what's so exciting to us is they, they embody what Adam just said to you. And the leader is somebody that we just think is incredibly powerful. She's an African-American woman who comes out of the labor movement, and she is heading this diverse issue of, of issues, you know, the mother of all issues, in inviting and organizing people across all. And so yeah, this, and this she is very clear that racial justice and democracy are... Yeah. She told this yeah. great story, just as a quick aside, I know that we have, to, we have other questions that have to wrap up, but she basically said to the coalition, she said, we're going to start showing up for police brutality. And some people felt queasy, and she said, too bad. <laughs> and that's kind of the approach we have to make. <laughs> too, too bad. Wendy Fields. Um, and she said, too bad. And that's now kind of what we need to do. Too bad. If you don't want to show up, you have to. Um, so we're pretty much out of time, but these two have been standing for a while. For so if, the, if you don't mind, maybe they can ask their questions both in a quick row and then a quick response to both of them. Yeah. Um, well, this was going to be kind of a pedantic theoretical question anyways. And I'm sorry that I might have missed this in the first couple of minutes, but um, how does like neoliberalism as a movement tie into the anti-democracy thing? Because it seems like there's a lot of overlap there, but I have a hard time understanding that. Um, and as I was formulating that question, when you said, when you realized you agreed, when you two realized you agreed on this issue, that you agreed on many issues, if not all issues, where does that leave you as in kind of a, sort of like a economic uh, justice sort of, uh, where, where do you want to go with that? Or do you not want to tackle that at all? And well, let's, let's, let's hear the, the okay. last question really quick and then we can have final thoughts on because that's a big one. Uh, for those of us who cannot take those nine days in the Capitol steps, <laughs> I call my senators all the time. Yes! Thank you. <laughs> and my congresswoman. Yeah. Uh, picking and choosing the, the catastrophe from the day. Is there something in your opinions that you feel like is the strongest ask that we can give to our senators or congresspeople that will have the most impact? Okay, so define neoliberalism and its relationship to <laughs> our modern politics and what's the single thing we should most be Let doing. me take the <laughs> yeah, go neoliberalism. For it, so we chose not to use the term neoliberalism because it's neo is new and liberal. It's, I think for a lot of Americans, unfortunately, it's a very confusing term. So that's why we worked hard and arrived um, 
it was hard work for us anyway, <laughs> to arrive at brutal capitalism as what we are defining so that people understand that we're not anti-market per se because that will not win you many, many fans in the United States, right. but we are defining it as this very narrow reductive idea that the market is driven by one rule, this highest return to existing wealth. And so it, 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 it effectively is saying the same thing of prioritizing capital over all other values, but we just don't use that word because we don't think it works well in other parts of the world, but not so much in the U.S., I'm afraid. Yeah, and you, there's no way we'll ever get a democratic economy without first fixing our democracy first. We, we just can't. I mean, I, I, we got this question yesterday about which comes first, reconceptualizing our economy or fixing our democracy. How, how can you possibly go against the big banks without first getting money out of politics? It's just, it's impossible. It's not a fight I, I would pick. Um, so it's, it's, it's totally, you know, intertwined. And I think that, you know, we believe that once you unleash real democracy, that people will have a say in all aspects of their lives, including the economy. Um, and in terms of the second question, what you can do if you don't have time to take nine days? Uh, well, there are many things to do. Um, we highly support joining an organization that's doing this work. That's more of a time commitment than calling, but there are a lot of really good organizations, especially in Washington State, that are doing this hard work, and they need all the people they can get, really. I mean, the, there are good folks out there who need volunteers. And in terms of what you can ask for your senator or congressman, just bring up these issues. Yeah, I don't think there is one pivot point at this time. There are so many critical ones. So I think here is where we follow our, our hearts and, and our own analysis of what seems the most important at, our time, at the time. But again, this hopefully we are going to evolve this website so that people can go on and see, okay, right now this is the cut, cutting edge uh, of democracy reform. So you know, and we love your feedback on it. If you go to it in about a week, it didn't quite meet the goal of our tour. Uh, it didn't, you know, launch in the way we wanted it to. But if you go to that website, just uh, um, uh, fieldguidetodemocracy.org and give us your feedback as we develop it. And Yeah, and, and just one, one other very quick thing is that the way you influence politics is not just through calling your Congress member or senator. You can influence politics by influencing those around you. Yes. Talk absolutely. to your family. Talk to your friends. You know, give, you know, encourage each other to read books. You know, that's, that, that's, that's where this book came from. Our book came from other books. I mean, I'm not saying everything is, is from another book, but I mean, we learned from other people doing this work. And, and we need to teach each other because our institutions aren't teaching us about this stuff. So there are many ways to make a difference. And it's not all um, just calling. It's, it's, it's hard, but good work, and it can be really rewarding in mm -hmm. the process. And just showing up tonight, quite frankly, this is an example. I mean, this is our first um, event, uh, other than a bookstore event that we've done. The fact that you showed up and you asked these fantastic yeah. questions, and you responded to our message and encouraged us, you know, you're going to help us, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, be better at what we're doing. And so, uh, you know, every time we make the effort, you could have stayed home tonight, right? And uh, share anything that you've learned that has value to you. I think we are then all doing our part. And I really emphasize also the buddy system. Yeah. Just, just keep your eyes out, you know, as I did in that day in the rain. For somebody who really shares your passion and you can make commitments to each other and goad you on to stay, stay true to your to your commitment to work for democracy. So I, I just couldn't thank you all enough. It just You've so helped us, yeah. right? Go, go find a young person to mentor. <laughs> That's a great start. <laughs> just thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Francis Marlopay and Adam Eichen, thank you so much.